I'm John Bonet. Uh, I'm the author of The New Wine Rules, and I am here today to talk about wine and what we should all be drinking while most of us are stuck inside, and hopefully after we're all stuck inside and go back outside and keep drinking um, when it's nice enough for uh, rosé season, which, as we'll talk about, is actually all year round. Uh, and uh, I'll answer any and all of your wine questions and uh, go through hopefully some useful things and uh, have a glass of wine in my hand very soon. Uh, so there were two really important messages in the new wine rules that I tried to convey. And the first one is to drink with joy, which especially right now uh, in the middle of COVID is something we all could do. Um, and, uh, you know, wine can be... A, a, can be something you fall back on, but frankly, I like to think of it as something that brings a little joy to my day and week and uh, weekend. Uh, and uh, it's what I really wanted people to focus on when they were going through the book. And um, like I said, it's it's important that it be something that you that you come to not with nerdiness, not with snobbery, but with a sense of real uh, pleasure and need it where is pleasurable for you and not where you think you're expected to be. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I really uh, focused on enough to make it rule number one in the book was drink the rainbow. And what that means is that, you know, wine used to be white or red and maybe there was some rosé and now it's every color imaginable. There's pink wine, there's orange wine, there's light pink and dark pink. Uh, and all of them are great, and all of them have their purpose. Um, and so we'll go through a few um, today. Um, but uh, again, um, since there's a lot of time to, um, I was going to say time to kill, there's a lot of time to explore right now um, in terms of what you want to drink. It's a good time to, to try something new. Um, so what to drink uh, in general, but again, certainly right now as we're all stuck inside, um, I drink a lot of white wine at home. Um, we drink a lot of white wine at home. Val, my um, wife and uh, uh, camera operator, which is to say iPad operator. Um, so uh, I pulled a bottle of the uh, Altinger Steinerthal Brunner Veltliner, um, uh, one of the great white wines of Austria. Uh, and these are wines that uh, often for a fraction of what you pay for a, a red wine that's the same quality, um, really deliver extraordinary value. Um, what else? Um, Gamay, this could be Beaujolais, this is a Beaujolais from Fleury. Um, you know, if Burgundy's gotten expensive, um, Beaujolais has kind of stepped into its place. Um, and uh, still for, you know, around 25, 30, 35 dollars, you can get extraordinary wine that is, um, that drinks as well as good Burgundy. Um, this is actually from Domaine Lafarge Vial. This is um, Michel Lafarge, who's the great producer of Volnay in Burgundy. Uh, he and his family bought land down south in uh, Fleury, which is one of the, the great communes of Beaujolais. And so this is literally all the talent of Burgundy in a bottle that's a fraction of the price. Um, what else? Rosé, um, which again, uh, like I said, you know, it's no longer a Memorial Day to Labor Day thing. Um, this is the Lioko uh, Indica uh, Rosé. It's made from Carignan from Mendocino County, uh, County in California. Um, and we've been drinking a lot of this, not gonna lie. Um, but again, it's, you know, there's nothing that's not fun about Rosé. Um, and it's a wine that uh, we have been enjoying a lot. Uh, while we've been stuck inside, but again, it's, you know, especially in New York, uh, it's been a little bit of a, um, a rainy kind of gray spring, and so it's been our way to, to kind of pay it forward on summer. Um, and, you know, there's also, uh, what else? Um, one of the things in the book that I, I really tried to hit home on is that um, if you really believe in value, one of the ways to find it is to drink from regions that are uncool right now. Um, there's probably nowhere less cool than Bordeaux, um, which is why I have been drinking a lot of Bordeaux. Um, this is the uh, Chateau de Champs des Uh This is from uh, saint foy which is like as far out as you can go in Bordeaux. Sorry, I'll do it this way. As far out as you can go to the east of Bordeaux uh, before you get into other parts of the southwest. Um, and this is from a husband and wife team. Um, uh, uh, and 
Um, Corinne is one of the great biodynamic consultants in Bordeaux, and um, her husband uh, is the cellar master at Ponte Canet in Poyac. So this is like their weekend farm. They fire, farm it biodynamically, and this wine shows up in New York for about $16, um, which you would struggle to find that level of winemaking quality um, in any wine, white or red, for that amount. Um, and if it was, if Bordeaux was any cooler, it would probably cost a lot more money. Um, sherry, uh, always. Um, I think people should keep a bottle in their um, refrigerator if you can. Again, it's um, you can use it in cocktails. You can start out a meal with it. Um, there's. No reason, I think, at this point, I mean, ever, but certainly right now, there's no reason for anyone to feel like wine has to be something fancy. And so, um, you know, any of these can be drunk at any point. Um, if you like wine coolers, um, you could drink that. Um, or wine spritzers. Sorry, I'm getting a, a, a puzzled look. Um, this is Hoxie, uh, which is out of L.A., um, drunk in our house quite a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a way to sort of ease into um, your happy hour. Uh, it's, you know, wine and sparkling water and flavors. And so um, it's, you know, about 5% alcohol and a way to, um, to get started slow. Um, although, uh, if you enjoyed last week's happy hour with uh, Robert Simonson, um, which we did immensely, um, you could also get started very fast with martinis, which has been happening not infrequently around our house. Um, and honestly, you know, um, just because you're not out at a fancy restaurant right now is not a reason to sort of um, just drink basic stuff. I think that's fine, but I, it's also nice if you take, let's say, one night a week and really splurge and, and open something nice. Um, this is like the Domaine de Collier um, uh, Anjou Blanc from the Loire. Um, it's not a super splurge, but um, it's made by Antoine Foucault, who's really um, the superstar talent there. Um, has, uh, made the wines at uh, Clos Richard for a long time, um, and this is his own property. Um, it's hard to find, uh, and it's going to get opened. It's going to get opened before the end of the week, pretty sure. Um, and of course, very importantly, um, champagne. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it seems perhaps weird um, to be opening champagne right now. It's a difficult time uh, for a lot of folks, but if you have the ability to, um, I think. It's important to find little moments of celebration um, and sparkling wine uh, of all sorts, but especially champagne, is a way to just kind of make a celebration um, in and of itself immediately. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we, same thing, try to open like at least a bottle of champagne a week, uh, or in the case of this past week, when it was Valerie's birthday, uh, a bottle of champagne about every hour. Um, <laughs> Not quite, but, but almost. Um, we have a lot less champagne in the house than we did um, a week ago. Uh, what else? Um, so I think uh, it's worth talking really quickly um, just about some of the basics of like having wine, opening wine. Um, people tend to get very nervous about it and, um, and often spend like way more money than they have to. And I love to encourage people not to. It is really the basics are very, very simple. Um, in terms of opening, um, this is literally all you need. Um, it's a waiter's friend corkscrew. You can find it for less than $10. Um, this one cost about three bucks, I think. Um, reason you want it, and I'll open a bottle of wine in a second, um, is that the lever, the lever system on it allows you essentially to pull the wine, uh, to pull the cork up uh, with minimum effort and versus like the winged corkscrews, which everyone loves, those are awful. You should throw it out. Uh, it, they, they, they're like, they are the most insane piece of engineering for the task I've ever seen because they take what could be a really simple, uh, uh, process and they make it incredibly complicated and you're like struggling to get this thing on top of it and then keep it on and then you have the wings and anyway, this is like, the cheap, effective, good solution. Everyone should have one. Um, you know, you can even get them now, not this one, because um, they often come with blades. Uh, you can get them without the blades, and then you can actually even bring them in carry-ons for whatever time we never get on airplanes again. Um, glassware. Uh, people tend to be very worried that um, there is, uh, um, like, you need a different glass for every for every wine, um, it's silly. It's kind of one of those things that the glassware industry has perpetrated, and I think it's unfair. Um, luckily, now people are starting to move to yes, I'm touching this with my hands. Um, uh, 
they're starting to move to um, to all-purpose glassware. Um, this is the Gabriel Glass. There's also a Richard uh, Brendan um, that's around now. Um, and uh, Zalto makes a universal. There's a number of different universals. And they're designed to do right by a lot of different wines. They're not necessarily going to be absolutely perfect for every wine. Um, but for mere mortals who actually just want to have, um, like, uh, one or two, uh, you know, types of wine glass in their house, um, this is the way to go. Um, Honestly, what I recommend if you're like if you're shopping for glassware to get like a white wine glass. This is a Zalto. It's kind of their standard issue. I use this for a lot. I taste almost all my wines out of this, um, and then an all-purpose. Um, this is a Zalto Burgundy uh, stem. If anyone wanted to see how um, you know how far out of control things can go, um, this is beautiful. Um, you will drink very good Burgundy out of it. Um, I feel ridiculous holding it. Um, and uh, we have a few of them, and uh, this is the first time it's come out of the closet in, I think, three years. Um, so, but I wanted to have it out there just in case. Um, so, uh, opening wine. Uh, what should we open? I'm getting zero input. No. So, no, no input here. No input here. So, um, this is the Altinger. It's a good place to start. Um, I'm cutting the bottom of the foil off. You definitely don't have to do this. This is just my own weird quirk. Um, it just makes it easier. It's a little cleaner. Um, if I were a sommelier, which I am definitely not, um, I would have more tactful ways of doing that. Um, to open, you start the leader's friend at an angle. You twist it in. You twist it. Uh, as you're twisting it, you bring it to vertical. Um, you leave maybe a screw or so worth. Um, and then first lever, um, you pull up the first part, second lever, and that's why there's two notches. You pull up the second part, and you're done. Um, in about, I don't know, a fifth of the time it would have taken with a waiter's friend. Um, pouring some for our camera person, because it's important to keep her happy. Um, pouring some for myself. I'm actually going to pour it into the all-purpose, because these are great, and they do really well. Austrian glass, Austrian wine, everyone's happy. Um, what else? Um, let's see. I um, was talking about champagne um, a second ago. Well, um, in terms of glasses, I know a lot of people like stem, um, stemless. Um, I will always fight for a glass with a stem. Um, the reason isn't, um, isn't to be snobby. It's that um, when you hold a glass like this, you start to warm up the wine, and so literally one of the purposes of the stem is to keep your fingers away from the wine, and the longer, whoop, uh, the longer, <laughs> I haven't even started drinking yet, um, the longer you uh, can keep your fingers away from the wine, the more the wine stays temperature stable, and the slower it warms up, uh, and so you can kind of linger, assuming you're the kind of person who lingers. Um, we have a question. Yeah. Is it tacky to remove the foil entirely? Nope. No. Rip it off. Um, you know, I, if, honestly, there's a lot of winemakers now who are starting to get rid of foils because they're, um, they, they were more useful when that was um, a, um, a way to, uh, to sort of ensure that there was no tampering. But um, their time has kind of gone. It's why a lot of people have moved to wax or beeswax or, um, other, or other closures or honestly, like with the Lyoko, have just left it open. Um, take off the foil. No one will judge. Um, you know, I suspect within the next few years, as um, as the wine industry gets more and more conscious of its um, environmental impacts, that foils are going to go away because um, they're this piece of metal that doesn't really do very much. And if you want to work, if you want to seal the bottle better at the top, you can use wax, which is obviously biodegradable. Um, I was about to swirl. Um, swirling, great, great thing to do. Um, you know, it's, this is a bit of an acquired skill, um, uh, what I would say if, like, if that looks tricky, start, um, on a flat surface like a counter and just, I like a counter clockwise, you can do it clockwise and then, um, watch a centripetal force yanks the wine out of the glass, but, um, but just practice it, um, you just want to, you want to get it, um, moving around, the, the reason is to bring it into contact with the air, um, that, allows some of the smell of the wine to, um, to come into the glass um, and you really get a sense of it before you taste, which I'm going to do now. 
Hey, John, speaking yeah. of these white wines, we have a question. Um, okay the next day in the fridge if you don't finish it all? Yes, absolutely. Um, so are red wines and so is rosé. Um, basically, any wine will be good in the fridge. And I actually suggest putting your red wines in the fridge as well, and then you just take them out a little bit before you want to drink them, um, because the oxidation process will, will tend to go slower in the fridge, and so you'll get extra time. Um, if you you know leave, say, a German Riesling, which is really high acid, which again helps to preserve it, um, you can leave it in the fridge often for a couple weeks. Um, but whereas red wine, you might be done in two or three days if you left it on the counter, um, where essentially you're kind of slowly cooking the wine. Uh, if you put it in the fridge, you'll get, you know, maybe four or five days, maybe up to a week. Um, that is a good segue to talk about where to store your wine in the kitchen. Um, the quick answer being don't. Um, but uh, the fridge, you're, like a wine fridge is ideal, but not everyone has one. Um, we have just off camera, we actually have a second fridge for beverages um, because we're those people. Um, but even if you just like leave a few bottles of wine in your regular fridge, totally fine. Again, red will be fine in there. Just bring it out uh, maybe 45 minutes beforehand to, to let it come up to room temperature. Um, but even reds, you only want it maybe say 62 to 65 degrees. Um, so they don't need to be as warm as you probably think they do. Um, the one place, the absolute worst place that you can store your wine is here, which is why there's a plant here instead of a bottle of wine. Um, fridges cook wine. The tops of fridges cook wine. Inside fridges are great. So all of the um, hot air that is being taken out of the fridge uh, by the compressor tends to go up through and come out the back and sit on the top. Um, and often, as is the case here, your fridge is right near your stove, and so you're double cooking your wine. And I see people who have enormous, very expensive kitchen build-outs who've like built um, little uh, shelves or um, uh, racks for their um, for their wines right above the fridge, and it's painful because you look at it and you're like you're literally cooking your like two thousand dollars worth of wine that you put up here because you think it looks nice. Do we have questions? Yeah, um, really good practical question. Wine glasses in the dishwasher? Um, it depends on the glass. Um, a lot of glasses actually um, are made to go in dishwashers. Um, the big thing there is if you can, don't use detergent. Um, because it's often not the dishwasher that's a problem, it's the detergents that are used will film, uh, leave a film on the glass and then it's impossible to get off. Um, our glasses we tend not to put in the dishwasher. Um, one of the things uh, that I think is, two of the things that I think are really good investments, um, one is, a decent, ours is not very clean because we um, use it a lot, um, a decent specific uh, glass brush. Um, you can also get decanter brushes, but um, both in terms of the, um, the, the material that's used um, as well as the shape, it's made to be able to wash the insides of a glass um, really just with dish soap. Um, and the, the corollary to that um, is, um, this is our super cheap but also really reliable one, is a decent um, glass rack uh, to, for drying, and you just leave them like that, leave them on the counter overnight, and they should be dry in the morning. Um, it is, you know, it is not perhaps quite as easy as a dishwasher, but it's remarkably easy, um, and it will preserve or extend the life of your glasses a lot. Um, what about that hack that you use with the, the soap for the espresso machine? Oh, sure. Um, all the props. Ah, hidden. Um, so this is Kafiza. Um, this is uh, made to clean espresso machines. Um, and it's basically perchlorate. Um, and so, um, not, not that often, but if you really get sort of a sticky film in your glass because um, uh, what's staying on it is wine, um, which is obviously acid. Well, we've all been there when there's a lot of <coughs> yeah. mouth goo on the glass. Yeah. So one of the things that this does is chemically it rebalances um, whatever's stuck on the glass or in the glass. Um, and in the same way that it helps to descale espresso machines from all the coffee, also acidic, that tends to get stuck on there, um, it actually is a decent way to sort of to, to clean and to sort of shine up glasses. Not that often, but if you do it every couple months, um, it's a good kind of low-tech way to, um, to keep them shiny. Um, 
Great question about chilling red wines. Do you chill all of them or like, you know, talk about temperature and... Um, so... A lot of this will have to do with the type of red wine and the quality. Uh, if you really have some fine red wines, um, at that point it's probably worth investing in even like a little Home Depot wine fridge that's a couple hundred bucks. Um, just because you want to keep those somewhere around 50 to 55 degrees. Um, they shouldn't be super cold. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll be fine if they're super cold, but um, for stability, it's good if they uh, don't change temperature too much and they don't get moved around too much. Um, certainly, um, you know, I'm thinking of things like Cabernet, really, you know, fancier burgundies, things like that, maybe your better Pinot Noirs. Um, but everyday wine, totally fine, leave it in the fridge. Um, you know, certainly a lot of like everyday wine is um, either filtered, um, so it's going to be super stable in the fridge, or, uh, you know, it's going to be completely fine if you just chill it and then bring it up. Um, and frankly, a lot of the lighter red wines, things like uh, Grignolino from Piedmont, um, some Beaujolais, um, you know, it might be like reds from the Jura, or uh, even some lighter like Senso or Pinot Noir. Um, you can drink them with a light chill, especially in um, the summer. They're actually better, maybe at like 58 degrees, just above cellar temp. Um, so there's really nothing wrong with keeping your red wines a little bit cold. If you think about the way that they're stored, and we we're talking about for decades in cellars in France, they're stored at um, underground stable temperature, which is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you can keep them there or even lower, um, there's nothing wrong. Um, okay, a, few, a, a, a bunch of questions here. Do you have a favorite rosé? Or maybe you can talk about the styles that you like. Yeah, I have a lot of favorite rosés. Um, so, you know, everyone loves Provence rosé. I don't love Provence rosé. I find it too light. Um, most Provence rosé has become very, very industrially made. Um, and the reason it's so light is because they charcoal filter a lot of the color and therefore flavor uh, out of it. Um, I tend to like my rosés a little more color and a little more substance. Um, you can find that in Provence if you go to Bandol or Cassis, the two um, villages down uh, on the sea uh, south of Marseille. Um, the traditional style there usually has some Rivedra in it and those are pretty intense. Um, if you look at the Lioco, this is Carignan. This isn't super dark, but this is like a nice solid rose color. Um, and this to me is like a serious rosé color. Um, there's a lot of really extraordinary uh, rosé coming out of California right now, and again, these are like top, top winemakers. Lioko's doing it, um, Jolie Led, uh, you can find it from Mathiasen, Arnott Roberts, uh, Rhyme, there's, um, you know, great, great rosé that remarkably outdrinks itself for usually around 25 bucks a bottle. Um, the other, the other place that, um, to me is like, is the great untapped wonder is Germany and Austria. And the quality of German rosé that, um, is often made with Pinot Noir. Um, so if you're into Pinot, you can find not just red, but also rosés from the Mosel, from the Faltz, um, from Baden. Um, and we're talking about really some of the top winemakers in the world. You look at Caroline, uh, Caroline Deal, um, you know, she makes probably, arguably, some of the best Riesling anywhere in the world, and she makes a Pinot Noir Rosé that shows up for about $25, $26. You can find stuff that's $16, $18. Um, you know, it's, um, these are serious, serious wines, and again, you can absolutely drink them in the summer, you can chill them as much as you want, but you can also, frankly, keep them uh, into the fall, into the winter, into the next year, and they are even better. Um... A couple of quick questions, we're, and then we're going to come back to yours, Ben. Um, favorite value champagne? Hey, <laughs> favorite value champagne? Robert wants to know. Robert. Um, honestly, right now, it's probably Le Herit, um, or Ian Le Herit, uh, from um, the uh, Côte d'Assou d'Epernay. This is like just outside the just outside the city of Epernay. Um, not typically known as a, a major region in Champagne, but, um, but has really, really come up in quality. Um, La Herre, uh, biodynamically farmed, and you can, even in New York, you can get into those wines in sort of the low 40s uh, from the non-vintage. Uh, and the quality is extraordinary, the terroir is extraordinary, it just happens to be sort of historically disfavored, and so, uh, for the moment, at least, whereas a lot of his counterparts have gotten sort of expensive, Blair wines are ridiculously cheap for what they are. Um, favorite Brooklyn wine shops? 
Um, lots of them. Um, let's see. Uh, love Vinewine, love, um, love, uh, Henry, love Leon and Sons, Brooklyn Wine Exchange, Slope Cellars, uh, who am I forgetting? You said Leon and Sons? I said Leon and Sons. Um, so it's, it's always trickier for me because I, um, we live in South Brooklyn and so there's like this world of great North Brooklyn shops, um, that I just, like Uba, that I just like don't go, go to that often. Um, oh. The, uh, the other thing to remember is that um, a lot of restaurants right now, um, my day job uh, at Resi, we like, we spend all day talking about this, uh, a lot of restaurants um, are actually selling wine to go, often near retail prices, like Four Horsemen, um, and so uh, in addition to wine shops, you can also uh, get a lot of wines from your rest favorite restaurants um, because of changes to the law, because of COVID, that honestly everyone is hoping, praying, crossing their fingers are going to stay even afterwards. Uh, there's a shout out to Thirst. Yes, yeah, Thirst, as well. absolutely. Um, especially if you, like, um, if you like the natty stuff, Thirst is like, they bring in a lot of things that nobody else has. Cool. Um, well, here's a hypothetical for you from Ben. <laughs> Say you have a 12 bottle um, wine, little wine fridge. Um, you're thinking this about. Is clearly a hypothetical. <laughs> you're thinking about summer. What do you buy for under $25 a bottle to fill that, that you'll drink all summer? All summer. Um, so, as I said, um, I would go long on rose. I would buy a bunch of um, kind of uh, estate level, like QBA level. Um, German Riesling. Um, could be dry, could be off dry, but again, um, you can easily get in there sort of $16 to $22. Uh, I would buy a lot of Muscadet because you can drink that with literally anything, and you can still get the Pepier for probably $16 to $18, which is for me um, the benchmark, and uh, the quality revolution in Muscadet has made these drink as well as Chablis, but for like half the price. Um, I would look at getting some uh, let's see, um, possibly some Italian rosé, like some Bartolino, um, which is, again, delicious, from, uh, basically from Lake Garda. Uh, nobody sort of thinks about it, but the wines are extraordinary. Um, you know, there's places where it's harder to get into. California's harder to get into at that level. Um, you might look for the Tondu wines that, um, Steve and Jill Mathiasen make, which, um, are about $22, but it's for a liter, um, so it drinks well. Same with the La Boutanche wines, which are usually uh, France and Germany, which similar pricing for liter bottles. Um, and, um, yeah, I think those are all good places. I think, you know, there's some interesting Greek wine and some interesting Greek rosé. It's, it's a little trickier to find right now, um, but... Uh, all of those, as I said, Bordeaux, if you want to get a couple bottles um, of red, you know, barbecuing, burgers, hot dogs, things like that. Uh, and um, you can even get into, I mean, Red Beaujolais at, at a crew level has hit sort of a 25 to 35 range, but you can get both white Beaujolais, which nobody knows about, which is Chardonnay, which is extraordinarily good, and you can get Beaujolais Rosé, and those still like rarely top $20. So cool. there you go. We filled up. We filled up like forty-eight slots in your twelve you, bottle. You didn't buy anything from the continent of South America, John. Uh, I didn't. I <laughs> love what's going on in Chile, and I think um, you find not just from Itata, but uh, from a number of places that there's um, wines being made from Old Vine Mission, um, which is uh, arguably the first uh, vinifera grape to have come to this sh these shores. Um, uh, often this will be called Pipeño, which is sort of the traditional name for kind of farmer wine. Um, they are getting a little more expensive. You can still find them around $20. Um, they're delicious, and we talked about chillable reds, and this is like the definition of a chillable red. Cool. Um, it's 4.30. Do you have time for one more? I have time for a few more. A few more. Okay. Someone asked about your thoughts on Washington State wine. So I lived in Seattle for almost six years, um, and uh, like I love Washington State, and I have a great sort of emotional attachment to Washington State. Um, the difficulty for me has been that Washington hasn't really evolved that much in the past few years. If you look at um, not just what's happened in California, but what's happened in Oregon, uh, what's happened in 
all over the old world, like I said, what's happened with the new Chile, like, there's been a lot of evolution of styles, and I've seen relatively few of that type of wine come out of Washington. There's still a lot of big red wine being made there, um, and a lot of it is, you know, being made in a very similar style, so the quality is good, but I think um, I want to see more innovation come from Washington. Um, do you have any love whatsoever for Sauvignon Blanc? I do. We drank Sauvignon Blanc last night. We did. Uh, <laughs> it was good. Um, we drank a white Bordeaux. Um, there's great Sauvignon Blanc in the world. Um, it's important to remember that not just Sancerre, Sancerre is kind of a hot mess, but um, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good Sauvignon Blanc from Loire. There's a lot of good Sauvignon Blanc uh, from Bordeaux. That again, you find organic producers. Uh, Pei Bonhomme Les Tour, which is from Bly, um, on the right bank. We drank last night. Um, this is a Sauvignon Semillon mix that is extraordinary, and I think I paid eighteen dollars for it at Chamber Street. Um, you you know you find um, some really interesting ones in California. Again, their price is a little difficult, but we drank a um, a Lalona Sauv Blanc from Lioko, and these are really old vines um, from Redwood Valley that was extraordinary. Could easily take on a white Bordeaux. Um, New Zealand, you know. Yeah, whatever. Uh, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I've had a long time to be persuaded and I'm still not persuaded. Anything else? Um, Everyone drunk yet? Any, any, any final thoughts on, on this wine and why we should all be drinking more Gruner Valiner? Yeah, um, this is in an interesting place. Um, it's a very, it's a schmarag, which is the, the very sort of ripe, higher alcohol style. Um, I think we're drinking a little young. Um, it's delicious. Uh, I don't know that it's the aperitif that I would have. I probably would be drinking this um, as it's like 4.30 in the afternoon, or I'd be drinking this. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm gonna just go well, to that's there. a good idea. Um, it's after four, it's the end of our happy hour. <laughs> um, but, you know, these are, um, you know, that's not a knock against the Altinger. It's just that, um, you know, it probably needs a little more time and it needs, like, you know, it needs some... A decanter and a ham, shake. Which is what we're going to have later. Yeah. For... Um, oh, this is a really good question to kind of wrap up. Um, best way for a novice to keep track of what they've enjoyed... Great like, question. Yeah. Um, so definitely don't do what I do. Um, I have like a full database system in my computer uh, because I taste too many wines to remember them otherwise. Um, that's a little much. Um, although honestly, like if you if a spreadsheet works for you, that's not a bad way to keep track of what you drink. But like just get a notebook, whatever kind of notebook you like, and note the wine, note the date, note what you thought, like doesn't need to be formalized, just literally like, I liked it, I didn't, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, smiley face, sad face, um, and, uh, you know, just keep track however feels comfortable. Um, I think the important thing is to just keep keeping track of what you drink and what you like and what you don't. Um, Michael Broadbent, who has probably the most detailed notes um, on tasting wine in history, um, just, you know, always had a little pocket notebook and was always... Um, just jotting down whatever he thought for decades, for probably seven decades. Um, so, you know, it's a matter of finding what you, what, what's comfortable and what you can keep up with and just using it. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Val. Um, that's about it. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you don't have a copy, grab the new wine rolls. Um, and thanks to 10Speed for hosting this. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And I'll see you online and hopefully in person soon. Bye.